This episode is made possible by our generous patrons. To learn more, visit patreon.com forward slash ink to film. Welcome to the ink to film podcast where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke and I'm James. And this week, with the help of special guest Wendy Wagner, we discuss the end of Stephen King's 1977 novel, The Shining. like to welcome Wendy Wagner to the show. Wendy's poetry and short fiction has appeared in over 40 venues. Her third novel, An Oath of Dogs, a sci-fi thriller, was released just last year. She is the managing associate editor of both Lightspeed Magazine and Nightmare Magazine and served as the guest editor of Queers Destroy Horror. She also was the nonfiction editor of both Women Destroy Science Fiction and Women Destroy Fantasy. She's also one of the nicest, most genuine people I've met in the writing industry. Welcome to the show, Wendy. Hey, it's awesome to be here. Thank you so much for coming on. So we are talking The Shining. This is our third episode for The Shining, and we thought it'd be great to bring you on and talk about it. Uh, someone with all your experience and knowledge in the industry, and uh, <laughs> I, I, we just would love to hear your take on it. So I'm going to start off by asking you, when you first read The Shining, do you remember, and uh, what, what kind of like memories do you have surrounding this book? Well, I actually didn't read The Shining for the first time until... Um... It was a little less than 10 years ago. Um, I was a big fan of the movie, which I saw for the first time when I was in high in college. And it just took me a long time to, like, be ready for the other, like, like the real version, you know. The and um, <laughs> But I, I do love, like, Stephen King a ton. So I was like, okay, I just need to read The Shining because it's one of his best books. So I finally, I, I read it. Um, and I just remember, like, it was just such a delightful, fun ride of a book. And I just, like, tore through it that first time. Just read it so quickly. Just ripped right along. And I, I think that's, like, one of the most fun things about, like, Stephen King as a writer is that, um... He does have this magical ability to create books that you cannot stop turning the pages. It doesn't matter what time it is or how scary it is or how much you kind of are like, I can't read about any more horrible naked ladies in the bathtub. No, don't make me. But you're still, you're turning the page, even though she could show up at any time, you know. And I love that about him. (laughs) That's awesome. So I do want to know, uh, so in, in general, Stephen King, uh, how many of his books do you think you've read? Would you consider him uh, a, a writer you really look up to, other than just being engaging, obviously? I mean, and not look up to, but is he, is he, you know, is he uh, a writer you admire? Oh, definitely. He's definitely, I, actually, as I am recording this, my microphone, um, its arm kind of broke, so it won't stay upright very well. So I just have it like perched on top of a stack of books. And the top book is um, like the most precious book in my book collection. And it's a copy of Owen King and Stephen King's Sleeping Beauties, which I got last year. And it's actually like signed by Stephen King. Wow. I still actually haven't read that book yet because I'm like, <laughs> Like every time I just like pick it up, I'm like, what if something happens to it? It has to just stay here in the office. <laughs> so I might actually just cave and get it from the library and read like a junkie <laughs> copy there um, so that I can finally read this book. But yeah, I, I um, love Stephen King. Um, he is so- probably a major part of why I actually like sat down and became like serious about writing. Um, you know, I always wanted to be a writer, uh, but I got really kind of sucked into that notion that like, I, if I was going to write, I should write like the great American novel kind of thing. And Mm. I just like felt so intimidated that I just like really quit. And then a friend gave me a copy of on on writing when it first came out. And it just, it just, um, felt like it just gave you such permission to just be yourself on the page 
And it was like so tremendously, tremendously inspiring that it just, um, it has made him kind of a hero to me. I'd say like, you know, my two great like people that if I ever did meet them in person, I would probably just faint would probably be like the two biggest influences on me are probably um, Martha Stewart and Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But I have this great memory of being a kid, I think I was about eight or nine, and um, I have two older sisters, and we all would get books at the library, and they had gotten a copy um, of the of Night Crew. No, that's not the name of it, uh, but something like that. So suddenly my brain is just like failing. Skeleton Crew! It's skeleton crew. And I just remember like they were it, passing it back and forth, reading these stories. And like the, they were in agreement that like the one story in there, the raft was just like completely the most terrifying thing they'd ever read. And so I knew I kind of probably shouldn't be reading it because it seemed like, I mean, my parents didn't care what I read, <laughs> but I knew that it was like, if it was super scary, I was like probably like pushing my limit. But I remember, like, opening up that book and reading that story to see, like, how scary is it? Like, it's freaking scary! (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if you're familiar with that short story, but it is terrifying. I've heard heard great things about it, and it's been recommended (laughs) to me, and I need to read it. Because now that's like, I've I've heard enough now, and I'm just like, I've got to go read that. (laughs) Yeah, so that was, like, my very first Stephen King experience, and um, I never really, like, looked back. (laughs) Uh, so I was going to ask you, so we have um, a, a, a section of our listeners tend to be writers or, you know, people who are uh, aspiring to be writers. And I, I wanted to see if you can pick out anything to put you on the spot a little bit. Is there anything about Stephen King's writing that you think people in particular should re- really pay attention to, especially new writers? Definitely, I think that his handle on pacing is um, just absolutely phenomenal. He's just a master of knowing um how much to torment his readers <laughs> and and push them like with action scenes or thrilling moments or suspense and how when just when you're at the brink of being like oh my gosh I got to take a break from this he gives you a break and he puts you in a quiet moment in just the perfect way um and I feel like he is really masterful at controlling the way events unfold in his books and to keep you like really engaged with them. So that's, I would say he's just, um, he's really, really good at that. And especially if you're interested in writing novels, I think that he has exquisite control of pacing. Um, his short fiction is great too, but it, you know, it's, it's more of just like a giant, it's just like a little explosion of, of fun, Mm. but his novels, I mean, I, I, you can't, it's hard to read a book, that has like 50 pages that go by before anything happens but like you're completely riveted to it like yeah. i would say like a uh, bag of bones is a great example or uh uh what's do my key is that, that's the one where he goes to the main character goes to florida to stay in the house after he's had this terrible accident um and and seriously i think it is 50 pages before anything happens besides him doing crossword puzzles <laughs> but you're like you're into it. It's somehow, somehow that there is a quiet intensity to those opening scenes that is still like super riveting. Yeah, he, he, like, he finds a way to add tension to like the mundane and, yeah. and intrigue. So yeah, I agree. Like even the start of this novel, I'm thinking back, it's just Jack Torrance kind of interviewing for a job and somehow it's still riveting. Yeah. It's so great how he can do that. I really like something you said there about uh, his control of pacing because I feel like here in this in this fifth the fifth part of this novel, mm-hmm. The Shining, we got a lot of that. And and you were you were speaking about how right when you feel like it's too much and you might need to take a break, he cuts to something else. And it's just the perfect thing to keep you engaged. He did he did that a lot with Halloran, and we'll talk about that yeah. in a little bit. Yeah. And I was just like, every time I felt like I was like, oh my god, everything's gonna go down. This is the end of the book. This there nothing else can possibly happen. We'd shoot over to something else crazy that we <laughs> that is like a breather, but also leads you into another one of those kind of like peak moments that that yeah. then he cuts to something else. It's amazing to like look at it from the perspective of craft just especially this last third of the book it's just like so tightly done Mm. so neatly braided you know like the boiler in the basement it's building and building and building and then 
it explodes yeah. in this last part. Ah, it's so great. <laughs> Which, by the way, uh, I wanted to, to touch in with you, James, because we've been going through this book, and it's your first time reading it. And mm-hmm. your only experience with it, James, was uh, was the movie. And so I wanted to see what your just kind of general thoughts were on this last part. And like, because it's pretty different than the movie, right? It has a, it's right. a pretty big departure. So I just wanted to see what your take was on it. Yeah, it was it was very different. So there were things that I was kind of like, I felt like the story was leading me to. Like, I felt like the boiler was something that I, I could, not that I knew that it was going to blow up and destroy everything, but I felt like that was going to become an important, a very important plot point. Right. And um, things like that being different, I, I found really fun. Um, what'd you say? I said it creeps. It creeps. It creeps. <laughs> it creeps. You got to be careful. Uh, uh, and then, and then things went full Stephen King uh, at, at some points. Like there was, there were times, and I, I don't necessarily want to say how I, where I land on uh, which I like more right now because I feel like it's just fun to talk about it, mm. the differences. But um, it felt like some of these elements nearing the end felt very similar to another book that we've covered, it, and mm. kind of the how it ended, and it kind of ends in this. Yeah. Um, this you this mysterious uh force of nature what's like what is that being what does it mean in in this hotel and and there's a lot of that that goes on there at the end which i can see i can understand kubrick cutting in the film but we'll we'll talk about the film later sure (laughs) yeah i do feel um so both it and the shining are like connected with the way that evil works because like So I I still haven't read the Dark Tower series, but it's all addressing, like, his main forces of evil Mm. in his mythos. Um, And so, like, even some of the books even come with a chart that show, like, which of his books are actually about, like, the Stephen King mythos and and which of them aren't. And how they connect and things like that. Um, And so definitely, like, it and The Shining are sort of um, functioning on dealing with all things that that kind of material wow. in very kind of different ways but kind of the same i didn't know that i didn't know it was that elaborate that's cool yeah um i think if you get dr sleep um uh, which is obviously the sequel to the shining mm-hmm. if for it addresses that more like more clearly and i think it might have one of those charts at the beginning that show how they're connected well he would have developed it a lot more by then whereas this was his right, third exactly. novel so it was probably still pretty you know nascent you know at that point right so. yep i mean even it is much later than this yeah um so i think it was something that like as he's been writing you know, the more you produce, the more you can kind of like see what your themes are. And you can also play around and like have these Easter eggs of how, well, actually, these books are secretly in the same universe. And you (laughs) didn't realize this, but that bad guy actually knew this other character. And like, I don't know, that's like a really fun game. It's fun to play for yourself. And then, you know, I think also fans like come to love that too. (laughs) Yeah, when you when you publish what was it fifty eight novels we we saw <laughs> earlier, like you have more uh, more availability to do that sort of thing. I think. Yeah, exactly. It helps to be prolific. <laughs> He's so prolific. That's something that I am very jealous of. I, I wish yeah, I could. Me was, too. At some point, he said he was writing ten thousand words a day, which is just mind boggling. I mean, I've done that a couple of times, and then I can't like do anything like the next day. Right? You're just like broken. <laughs> I can't even get anywhere near that. I, I yeah, that's it's that's incredible. <laughs> All right, so uh, do we want to get, get into the summary? Do we have any more general thoughts we want to talk about or anything else about Stephen King either of you want to touch on? I mean, my my last thought basically just generally would be um, I'm really glad that I've now finished this novel because as much as I love the film, it's really nice to know exactly what the intention of this entire story was yeah. because I'd always heard how much Kubrick had changed the, the film to, to meet his own needs and... and uh, it was really fun to, to actually see why this was known as the one of the great Stephen King novels. Yeah. Uh, have you have either of you seen the miniseries that Stephen King wrote the screenplay for? I, did, I have not. I've seen pieces of it. Because it's it's so true to the story. Uh, we've had I've had a few people recommend it, recommend it to me. They said it's not necessarily that great, but it is a lot more um, authentic to the story. Yeah, I think that one of the nice things about it is, you know, after you've read the book and after you've seen the Kubrick, it's fun to watch that and see, like, ways that Stephen King tweaked his own story uh, to, like, underscore more of what he was thinking about later about that book. 
Um, so that's like a nice, uh, another conversation you can have with the text like later and see like how those come together and how they don't and things like that. Yeah, I like that. I wonder if there's some way we could find a way to cover that, James. So there's a bonus episode or or maybe if we get when, when we go to cover Dr. Sleep. We could we could maybe kick off the coverage by covering the Shining miniseries real quick to kind of re- be a refresher. That might be a good way to do it. Yeah, I would like to. Yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. Cool. So, all right, I think I'm going to get into the summary here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read a little bit of summary, and then I'll just throw it to you two, and you can kind of give me your reactions or thoughts about that section if you have any, and then we'll move on. All right, so Halloran's in Florida shopping for the resort where he works. When he's driving back, he hears Danny's call, which is what we left with last time, Danny sending out this help call for help, and he almost goes off the road. He then convinces his boss to give him some time off and rushes to the airport. What did you think of this like uh, this this long distance uh, phone call Danny makes here to 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 Halloran? <laughs> I love this moment. Um, I think for me, Halloran is probably my favorite character in the book because mm. he's just an all around nice guy, um, and and. I love the way he doesn't hesitate for a second to go to Danny's aid. Like, he doesn't blow it off. He just takes it so seriously. And I love the fact that it's described having this, like, you know, he doesn't just, like, hear Danny being like, dick, dick. It's described as, like, how it, like, explodes in his head. And he has Mm -hmm. to, like, he almost drives off the road. He's got to go to the A&W and get a soda. And he's just, like... It's so intense and like it just really underscores like the power of Danny's gift and like the power of of the enormity of like what Danny's up against. And I just feel like it's it's so great. I also feel like um, the first sentence in the chapter that this is in is, is a really strange first sentence. I think he said, I think it starts out, Mrs. Mrs. Halloran's third son, Dick, Mm -hmm. dressed in his cook's whites. And uh, it's just like, it's such a strange way to refer to anybody, especially because, like, Dick has talked quite a bit about, like, how he had a grandma who has the shining. And, um, and, And so we've heard quite a bit about that family member, but we've never heard anything about his mom. And so it's just like this kind of weird, odd, um detail to pop out also i think it does kind of underscore a little bit uh one of my favorite little neat things about this book is probably how nobody not any of the real characters go by their real name and i just think Mm. like that is such a neat neat thing because even even horace derwent is mostly called harry by his friends as we see in this last section he's like the last character to reveal this like false name Business. I didn't think about that. Is, so in Wendy, I think we learn at some point Wendy is maybe her middle name? No, she says it's short for Winifred. Ah, Winifred. That's what it is. Okay. And of so... course, Jack is always a nickname for John. Mm. And uh, Danny is for Daniel. And he's also and, called Doc throughout. Right. Mostly called Doc. And then Dick is obviously a nickname for Richard. Yeah. And um, so I do think that there's something going on here a lot with like how... I feel like this is one of his, Stephen King's novels where he tries to be most playful with language. Mm. And I think that's kind of part of what's going on in this. And um, and so for me, I just think like that maybe that's like a little sly, little, that, that unusual way to describe Dick at the beginning of this chapter. Yeah, it's kind of uh, it's kind of this omniscient narrator voice a little bit, right? Like he, mm-hmm. he does this a lot and, and it's an interesting stylistic choice that he... he Seems to do in a lot of his novels. Yeah, it's it's more of a it's a third person, but it's it's the camera on that third person can move in or really tightly right in their head, or it can pull out to yeah. you know because he's not thinking of himself that way. Like most likely, right. that's kind of this outside judgment on him. Right. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I I did want to talk about one of the things we also try and do is touch on like social things whenever possible, and I wanted to call out um, Nettie Akorafor wrote this article for uh, Strange Horizons, I think. Um, and it's called Stephen King's Super Duper Magical Negroes. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've read that. And this refers to a trope that I've heard a lot of people talk about in reference to Stephen King, and that he often has these magical black characters who come in and save the white characters, usually yeah. in some sort of self-sacrificing way, and how over time people have recognized this as being problematic. Um, yeah. 
And I really love that article by her because she is a huge Stephen King fan and says so in the article and grew up reading him. Um, also, we're three white people here, so we're not going to, like, you know, break any <laughs> new ground talking about this. But no. I just wanted uh, to mention it. I don't know. Have you heard of this, James, or is this kind of new to you? I haven't heard of that, no. But I was really intrigued by his, his the way that he uses certain characters in his writing and the way specifically this was written in the 70s and the way that yeah. like he knew I was I was just kind of surprised in, in certain moments about about the way that he knew to get under this black character's skin and and like but I, I that is a good point that you bring up that that like he he does tend to write characters like that 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 tend to save save the day and yeah, I hadn't even thought about that honestly. You don't know about uh, some of the some of the major ones that are referenced are like the stand, um, and which I don't know if you know anything about. And then nothing I think, about that uh, one. The was it the Green Mile? The Green Mile's him, yeah. Yeah, that one. So there's a few of these where he's done this sort of thing where it tends to be like the only real black character, and that black character is magical. And uh, Nettie points out in her article that this is sort of a like an ingrained thing where. Uh, you know, people of color are associated with being like mystical because hmm. they're kind of exotic and how it's, it can kind of be perpetuate this stereotype. Right. I, I'm not going to do it justice. I, honestly, the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to link the article in our show notes for people who, who want to check it out. And it's written from the point of view of a fan of Stephen King. So I definitely recommend reading it. Um, and it's really interesting. And I think it's something that Stephen King, um, you know, probably didn't do on purpose. It, it was an accidental thing that he probably internalized and. Um, it's interesting to see how he's kind of, uh, I don't know. I know I want to read more of his more modern stuff to see if that's something he's addressed at all. And maybe Wendy can speak to that. If you've read more of his, uh, more recent novels. I feel like what I've read recently, I, I don't think there are any characters who fall into that, but I mean, I haven't read, I, I mean, I'm still behind. I haven't read Under the Dome. I haven't read 11, 2663. Mm. Um, so I, I've missed quite a few of the books in how, more recent years. How do you but. feel he handles writing an African American character like this? Um, because I what, I what I was trying to say before is I feel like there is a couple spots where it gets a little touchy. The things that he, yeah. he decides to talk about, like he yeah. doesn't have the first person knowledge to speak like this, and he's and like it seems like sometimes he goes he like toes a line and then goes over it a few times, but. I'm not really sure. What do, what do you guys think? Yeah, I, I kind of, I agree with you. Like, there are definitely some times reading this, um, especially this first section, like, talking about, you know, like, you've got a line about how the only, he didn't, he didn't know what color they were when they were talking with their minds or something like that. And you're like, I don't know. Or that doesn't seem quite, yeah. like, what, Why would he be thinking that, what yeah. it's about, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, um yeah, you would think that 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 De Calaran goes around just constantly thinking about how he's black, like it just is <laughs> always on his mind, because that's uh, kind of how it is, and when Stephen King's writing it, <laughs> right, yeah. it keeps coming up. <laughs> so something I did want to address in this section was the fact that he um, he also can't be- he's thinking to himself and he can't believe that he's left Danny up in the overlook now that now that Danny's calling down to him he's like how could I have left him and he remembers a time that he went into room 217 and saw the woman and uh, yeah. I just think that's really cool backstory to know that he knows that the, the danger's there and that there's things there but they didn't hurt him so he thought that they wouldn't hurt Danny but he's so Danny's he realized that Danny's so powerful that of course they would attack him and he can't believe right. that he was ever so so uh naive yeah I thought that was great because you know He's so concerned with Danny in that first scene and, like, so loving and gentle and kind with him and does specifically warn him not to go into 217. And so when Danny has that experience, you do immediately, like, doubt Dick. Like, how could Dick have given him this bad advice? How could he have not been more serious about, like, watch out for room 217, it is creepy AF! Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, like, to realize, like, no, no, Dick really was being true. He just doesn't have the kind of power that that Danny has and so he didn't have the same experience and so I thought that was really nice to like because you you do in the middle maybe doubt Dick a little but then once you get back in Dick's head and you see like his perspective of like the events you're like no this is like the most true and possible good dude that you could could have in this book Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah he's 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 so likable um, so we, we, you know, we, we hate to see him get hurt later. Um, yeah. and it's, you know, it's, uh, 
he's he's a great character in my opinion, and 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 he works really well, and and I love to see him sort of spring into action here, and it's also a very kind of nice dramatic twist to have, you know, what he does not be quite as effective as we were hoping it would be, I guess. <laughs> right. Yeah. I can honestly say, like, I I thought for sure that he was a dead man at one yeah. point. Well, yeah. I mean, you've seen the movie, so <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right, well, let's get into this next section here, a summary. All right, so when Danny wakes up on the morning of December 2nd, he goes out into the hall and sees a man crawling on the ground wearing a dog costume. The dog man has a bloody face, and he threatens Danny. Danny goes back to the bedroom, and Wendy wakes up. After spending the night in the airport, Halloran finally makes it on the plane early this morning. Jack has spent the night in the basement with the Overlook's papers, and now he's in the lounge. This time, the bar is fully stocked. So we're covering some different stuff there. I want, I do want to talk on the dog, the dog stuff, because I know that's like a mysterious scene in the movie, right, where we see a flash of a guy in a dog costume. Yeah. Um, did you think you were going to get the answer to that from reading the book? <laughs> <laughs> I thought something might be there, but I, I also thought that, like, I always just thought it was like meant to be kind of just like saying, look how eccentric and crazy and weird things have been in the hotel before. Well, I I love that character, Roger the Dog Man, Mm -hmm. and how you see him first threatening Danny and being a tool for the hotel. And then, like, you see him later from um, from Jack's point of view. And you learn all about his backstory as, you know, Horace Derwent's boy toy. And uh, so I just feel like it's great to have him get used in those two scenes in such different ways. One in which he's like completely menacing and terrifying and one in which he's like really pitiable. And I feel like he's a great stand in for Jack. I mean, by the end of that scene where we see him in the bar doing tricks for Horace Derwent, you're... You're like, oh, this is, he's Jack's foil. He's what's going to happen to him. Yeah. And, and Jack, I think, even has a moment where he where he considers that possibility. Right, yeah. Yeah. All right, let's move on. The bartender, Lloyd, gives Jack all the martinis he can drink. Harry Derwent's 1945 masquerade ball is in full swing, and Jack is happy to be at the party. Delbert Grady, the caretaker who murdered his family, tells Jack he needs to punish Wendy and Danny for their bad behavior by killing them. Jack has a vision of killing Danny with a mallet. Soon the party disappears, but to Jack's delight, the bar remains stocked. Since the bartender is gone, he decides to make his own drinks, but hits his head and passes out when he tries to climb over the bar. It's 8.30 in the morning. Halloran has landed at the Denver airport and is trying to get to the Overlook. So we get a lot of party stuff here, right? Where he's basically in the party for a while, talking with everybody, (laughs) talking to Grady, who, who who is an interesting character in his own right. Yeah. I mean, I think what one of the greatest parts of what's going on in this part in the party scenes is like Jack is realizing that he's like in like a whole bunch of times at one time. Like it's yeah. like the hotel uh, exists in like all times at one time and it's all freshly happening all at once. And it's like um, it's like a really weird thing to stumble into because, you know, most most of the book feels pretty linear. And so then, like, now it just really, you really feel like the book is coming unmoored and coming into this, like, next terrifying (laughs) section where even time doesn't necessarily matter and and the true colors of the hotel are starting to really show through. Yeah. I love the way that, like, at the beginning of this book, like, Grady is described by Mr. Ullman as, like, just being, like this total loser dude who like yeah. is like a bum basically and um like when we see him in this scene he's like so classy and has a british accent and jack is even <laughs> like wow what's going on and he's like well you know the hotel is investing in me it's seeing i get educated and it's just like such a devil character, right? How tempting for a guy like Jack Torrance who wants to believe that he's like the smartest guy on the planet and so talented and amazing. Like, oh, if I stay in the hotel, it's going to make me the best writer ever. And I mean, um, Luke, if an you know, evil hotel offered to make you the best writer in the world, would you maybe <laughs> take up its offer, right? Yeah, it'd be tempting. <laughs> <laughs> We're soul or the National Book Award. <laughs> Uh, so I do want to ask, uh, th- that kind of opens the door for a question that I had earlier that I, I finally remembered now. Um, so we've been talking throughout our coverage of this and going back and forth about how sympathetic we find Jack, 
How much of yeah. it do we f- do we feel like is the hotel using his weaknesses against him and like do we feel sorry for him like he's being victimized? I mean, it's obviously it's a bit of both, right? Or do we feel like he his weaknesses are something that he could have bested and it's through his own trouble that's that's, that's getting him here and his own violence and and all that. So where do you fall on that spectrum? Well, as a quick aside, one of the things that the miniseries does is it attempts to make him an even more likable character. Okay. Um, so I think that's like kind of interesting because I feel like the Stanley Kubrick movie makes no attempt to make him more likable. I think it tries to make him less likable. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, Jack is a difficult character and you can't help but kind of I mean, you you want to feel pity for him. Like, he has this terrible backstory with his dad, who is, like, awful. Mm. And you do get this feeling, here's this guy that kind of grew up, like, you know, he's not quite poor white trash, but not far from it. And he was dumped into this situation dealing with, like, way above, like, the way outside of, like, the class situation that he grew up in. Teaching at a prep school would be very stressful and weird after, Mm. you know, But that said, I do feel like at just about every opportunity, he's like his pride in himself and his self-absorption just is like constantly like beckoning. Like it's like a giant like eat here for free sign to like the things that are in the overlook. And um, so it's it's a reading him is so much like watching Breaking Bad and you're like, mm. oh, my God, Walter, you <laughs> cannot make a good choice if it hit you in the face because you are an asshole. <laughs> so, I mean, that's how I feel about Jack is very okay. similar, but he's a truly compelling character because he like he does see that he's doing bad. He yeah. does know that he should be doing better. Yeah, we we mentioned how we mentioned how he 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 does obviously feel guilty and he'll often make these big proclamations about how he's never going to do this again. And <laughs> I always kind of would roll my eyes and then you know, the book has has as it goes on especially takes pains to say that this isn't him anymore. It's now the hotel kind of embodying him. Mm-hmm. But I go back to those earlier chapters where I think it still kind of was him and he was still doing some pretty terrible things and yeah. So I don't know. It's it's I I struggle to like how to see how much I actually feel bad for him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And 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 also the writer in me, I think uh I, I mean the writer in all of us, right? We have to identify with this with his struggle and and his desperation and his his want to have this sort of um recognition and and but then but then the way that he uses that as an excuse and the way that he turns to, you know, substance abuse and, and you know, physical abuse and all these other things, it's really like the dark side of, of the creative life, I think, too, which always made this book fascinating to me. Yeah. Wow. That's a really good way to look at it. And it's kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's get some more summary here. Are you ready? Ooh, yeah. All right, around noon, Wendy, kitchen knife in hand, goes upstairs to make Danny some lunch. She leaves Danny in the quarters with the door locked. On the way back down, she finds Jack passed out behind the bar, totally drunk and reeking of gin. When she wakes him up, he grabs her ankle and starts to threaten her. Danny appears and begs them to stop. Jack begins choking Wendy, and she hits him in the head with a decorative wine bottle. Then she and Danny take him to the kitchen and lock him in the pantry. At three in the afternoon, Jack is still very audibly trying to get out of the pa- pantry, issuing vile threats in a continuous stream. Uh, let's stop there on the summary here. So let's, I want to talk about all that, that, that showdown on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the stairs and then him getting locked in the pantry. It's a lot, of, a lot of good drama there. First of all, I just got to say, this book is clearly a product of its time when a Chi-Chi hotel would think it would be cool to have, like, those wine bottles with, like, you know, <laughs> on the table. Like, oh, yeah, this is 1970. <laughs> it's so classy and European. <laughs> I thought it was cool to finally see um, Wendy and, and Danny best Jack in, in a yeah. physical sense. Because it's like he's been struggling with with all of these things throughout, and I feel like Wendy at some points was worried about Danny's safety, but ultimately they're able to 
I mean, it's because because she got him with a bottle on his head, but ultimately they're able to take him down and and basically, you know, detain him. Uh, and they could have probably had had the hotel not intervene. They probably could have kept him there for till yeah. till whenever they needed, you know, April or whatever, March or whenever they said somebody would be there. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I just think that's interesting to think about. And to, to go back to what you were just talking about, about. Um, him not being in control anymore, but is he kind of? He's at this point agreed to the hotel. I'll I'll get them for you. Basically, I'll prove myself worthy, and then and then you'll take me in. So he's so far gone at this point. Even after he sobers up when he's in, when he's in the pantry, he's still saying all kinds of crazy stuff. And he's not like like Wendy tells Danny, he's no longer his father. Yeah, it's like such a. It's it's definitely I think the the major turning point of the that says okay. The gloves have come off. There's no hope for Jack Torrance. Full he's, villain. Yeah, he's gone totally bad. I, I feel like there's just no moment in this book where you're rooting as much for Wendy as that moment where she's just, you know, trying to kick his ass. And it's just like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> do it, lady, do it. He deserves everything. Well, I was pulling for, I wish Wendy would have, I wish this story had a different, had a different middle because i wish wendy would have gotten away with danny earlier on before the storm hit you know yeah, for the character's right. sake uh, just get rid of the third act completely yeah <laughs> wendy and danny get away jack just crawls around the hotel being a, dr- being a jerk uh, uh so i wanted to talk about the mallet in particular because that's a big difference in the book and movie and one people often talk yeah. about and that he yeah. uses a mallet throughout um some people really think the mallet is scarier um, and some people think the axe is scarier. I, I've heard both opinions. Um, I wanted to see where you fall on it, and then I'll kind of weigh in myself. But, I, yeah, I wanted to see where both of you fall on that. Well, I would say, like, the thing about this rogue mallet mm-hmm. that makes it good for the book, I think, is that so much of what matters about the story is the historicity of this place. And um, so having it be this thing that's, really kind of an oddball piece of athletic equipment that you're not going to find in any normal hotel, but you do find in a hotel that's been, you know, sitting around moldering for the last 50 years and and being kind of weird. Um, So it just, I think it is really appropriate for it to be there. Um, You know, and, and I do like the way that like it's got the two different sides, right? Like the hard side and the soft side. And that feel, it makes you kind of feel like you have to put like a little more foresight into like an intent into how will I whack somebody? Do I do it with the killer side or the not killer side? Whereas like an ax is just has one side, just only choice really. And um, yeah, so, I mean, I think the ax is really scary in the movie, but I do have a fond soft spot in my heart for this mallet. Mm. So I think that I think that I was all in on the axe um, really up and through the entire story until the end when Hallow Wren uh, is in the shed and he's yeah. like and then everything else is basically gone at this point and he's in the shed and he grabs the mallet and the darkness comes over him. Uh, that that really like like you were just saying, Wendy, that like shows that it's it's so connected to the hotel it's like it's like even this this small object is connected to the hotel so i I like that element of it um in terms of scariness i i'm still going axe because i don't know i just love (laughs) the the scene i love the scene of of jack running down the hallway with an axe and that like jack nicholson i don't know if i can get that out of my head (laughs) okay so yeah I, i agree that the i think the axe works really well for the movie because it is it's so dangerous and so seeing him with it is is scary in that sense. One of the reasons why I think the mallet works really well for the book is that we're able to see him actually connect. Um, and it's it's yeah, I mean it's dark. He's 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 hurting <laughs> uh, our characters that we love, but he's he's able to like smash Wendy in the back and hit her in the you know what I mean? And like he, he yeah. hits multiple people and he breaks uh, Halloran's jaw with it later. And if you have an axe, like you can't really do that. Like either you're chopping <laughs> off a limb or you're so like basically killing somebody. So it's like um it's more it's a more extreme weapon, but because of that, like you can't have these kind of like interactions where people are getting hit multiple times and bones are breaking and teeth are flying and because of that it's very brutal. 
Um, and, and then, yeah, I really like the way he describes it throughout how it's like, it's like getting, it's like wearing down cause he's been smashing it into everything so much. Um, and so that's just a cool visual too. Like it's, it's, it's like, just like himself, like it's getting worn down by this and it's, it's getting scarred and it's covered in blood and it's getting, getting splintered and all that stuff. So. Yeah. I love that. I also think like how horrible do you have to be to pound somebody to death with like a mallet versus i mean anybody could get like kind of like riled up and like swing an axe and then be like remorseful oh i just accidentally cut off my wife's arm and i didn't really mean to do that (laughs) shit but you know you're gonna be whacking somebody for a while before they're dead with that (laughs) croquet mallet croquet mallet yeah (laughs) Uh, all right, so when this, when these sounds stop, almost two hours later, Wendy and Danny wonder if he's gotten out. They hear the elevator start to move as the Overlook Hotel comes to life around them. Meanwhile, Jack is eating Triscuits in the pantry, trying to gather his strength. He'll need it to punish Danny and Wendy for their, for their betrayal. He begins to feel sorry for his father and understands why he beat his mother with a cane. She must have betrayed Jack's far- father like Wendy betrayed Jack. Soon, Grady arrives outside the pantry door. Jack agrees to kill Wendy and Grady, uh, Wendy and Danny if Grady will let him out. So Grady lets him out. In the kitchen, someone has left something for Jack, in, uh, a martini ga- glass, a fifth of gin, and a dish of olives, and a mallet. Now Jack is happy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, I, I, yeah, I, I also wanted to talk a little bit about, Dan, about uh, sorry, Grady speaking on behalf of the the inn's like overall manager right this this other almost like lovecraftian horror type <laughs> being that we never see in inter- i don't know if we ever really get direct things from him although maybe we hear some some words like if, if that's what's hitting halloran at, at later i don't know if that's the over the overlook itself or not well is he um, is he also like the the ma- when he's unmasked when when jack is unmasked later is that would you consider that to be him do you know what I mean? Maybe, uh, yeah. Like, is that the or is that the hotel itself? It might be. Is this? I I wanted to ask you, James, and I don't think there's any way we can answer this because we haven't read all these charts and everything. And maybe Wendy knows. <laughs> but is is this Pennywise? Is this an early version of Pennywise? I don't think it's exactly Pennywise, but it might be like Pennywise's brother or something. Like it's somebody. It's some <laughs> other entity similar to Pennywise. Yeah, okay. yeah. I think it is. I mean, there's that recurring. Uh, I can't even think of what he calls them, but there is this idea, right, that that's in like the mythos, um, that you can become like a horrible person, and then you kind of like channel. Sometimes they're just called like the things, and they come from this other dimension, and they're like monsters that are horrible, and you they become you, and you become them, and there's like a blend of them, and that's you know what Pennywise is, mm. and um, it's addressed very much in Doctor Sleep, um, and and so I think I think when we see Jack at the end on mask, I think it's more it's kind of like the the manager, which I think is the thing that that has established itself inside um, inside the hotel. I think it's like wearing Jack, like you know the hand yeah. and the puppet kind of thing, and and it's like it's such a poisonous, toxic thing that it's actually like breaking down his very flesh and like rotting him from the inside because we're not meant to like contain that kind of evilness dolores claiborne has um really good introductory stuff about these creatures i think it's it's probably like one of his best books for that oh cool james were you about to talk about danny the danny scene i was about to talk about maybe (laughs) but when danny refers to it as it basically yeah. Well, no, I was going to specifically say he he says you're a mask to him. Right. And that lining up with the a whole unmask mask of the red death and then yeah. like we talked about like you you would just said, you know, he's wearing jack like a mask. Right. Um yeah, it all that all lines up. I like that. It all tracks really well. Yeah. Um The other thing cool. is um Danny uh Danny addresses the fact that whatever whatever that creature is that's that's kind of controlling Jack um has to control Jack in order to affect the physical world during that moment. Like he kind of right. says, like you have to use my dad um, in order to turn off the boiler. Like he, that, like what happens in a little bit when when he when he says something to him, and it's basically he realizes like he might be able to affect and manipulate people 
and they you know they talk about Danny being almost like a battery potentially for this hotel while he's there mm-hmm. and it's like this is this is like um this is probably more than the hotel's ever done before or ever will do again just because Danny yeah. and so to be able to manipulate Jack like this is a big moment and then they, they kind of blow it in the end whoever this entity is yeah, exactly. One thing um, at the very beginning of this little section that is nice is uh, Stephen King does give us that little reminder to help ground us. Because when they're up in their when they're in their quarters, she Wendy puts her head down on the heat register to see if she can hear. Because they've been listening to Jack ranting and raving down in that pantry, and she can't hear it because the furnace turns on. I love that. Yeah. And I'm, at the, when, you, when you first start just reading it, you're like, you're kind of like, oh, the hotel is trying to obscure it so she can't tell what's going on. But then at the same time, it is just that little plant so that you are primed for the boy, that boiler. <laughs> so you were just talking about how uh, Danny says you have to use my father to affect the real world. How do we feel about Grady letting jack out of the pantry because that is almost kind of like breaking that rule like grady is able to affect the physical world and unlock that door um does that feel at all like a cheat or does that seem like that's that's within the realm of of this of this this story that's a tough one i have always gone back and forth on that like whether it's the movie or the um the, the story and I mean there is a little bit of a setup I mean it was it was Danny that locked the door and they do talk about how to actually keep the door locked you know it's got to be you know the bolt has to go in just the way the right way and so there is you know a slight chance that maybe you know Danny didn't quite get it in right and after like leaving the door alone for a while like it's sort of like slid a little and maybe that's <laughs> you could stretch it like that but I also feel maybe that is part at this moment it's kind of like that whole the hotel at this time is all the times at one time and and uh. we're at you know that the door is unlocked sometimes yeah so it's sort of like even though mostly the hotel can't do anything physically, it does turn the elevator on and off all the time, yep. which has to be controlled by a lever inside. So right. it does have some abilities with physical stuff. And those usually manifest like around party stuff. So I think maybe that is kind of what's going on is it's just sort of like smooshing time around a little bit to mm-hmm. kind of rewind time i like that that's like an inner universe answer for it (laughs) i like that i hadn't considered that you you band-aided that really well because like i felt like that was a a kind of a plot hole but i think you i think you solved it there (laughs) yay well the reason i i like it i think narratively to me is it it if i ever get too comfortable in my knowledge of what something can and can't do then it starts to become less scary so I, I like that, in a sense, this is sort of saying, like, oh, you thought I couldn't do this? Well, let me show you that I can. And so all of a sudden that makes the hotel even scarier because then you're now like, wait a minute, what can it do? What can it, you know? And so you're kind of always left wondering. And Pennywise was like that in It, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I have another question then if we're, if we're going down this path. W- okay. Couldn't this maybe potentially the, this entity have manipulated the hotel into the boiler being at a time that it wasn't for, about to burst? Right. Exactly, right? Like, why doesn't it save the boiler itself? If it can run the elevator and open that door, why can't it just undo the steam thing? Yep, undo the steam. But I also think, like, a lot of what this book is about is about how when you lose control, you get stupid. Yeah. And it is about, like, it, it's so much of it is about, you know, drinking heavily. And I think the hotel has been drinking heavily from from uh from Danny and I think there's a reason why it's like Dick Halloran always calls it the shine you know it's not just like because this like the shining sounds like a cooler thing than you've got a gift or something I think Mm -hmm. it has a little bit of you know because of like moonshine is like an actual (laughs) liquor that you know I think that maybe there's a little bit of that there. So, like, there's this idea of this, like, hotel growing drunk off of this, like, kid's magical powers. And uh. and it's really stupid by the end. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the hotel forgetting about the boiler definitely was, I feel like, somewhat 
represents Jack losing control as well. Like it's like the once the yeah. once this this entity like has you, um, and I think it's just that that idea that like if you have too much power, like that folly is going to follow if you're not careful, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. So one other thought I, I had about how this could make sense in the in universe is that it could there could be a finite amount of power that the Overlook has at any given time. And uh, Jack is in the pantry for a long time. And so you could yeah. say that maybe it was building up to be able to do this one small act like of unlocking charged. it. And then when it does that, it's kind of like spent and then it uses its powers maybe later to like embody him. But maybe there's like a finite allocation to where it doesn't have enough power left to then do the the pressure. Right. It definitely is described as being kind of difficult to do as well. Like he really had to work yeah. it like it. Yeah. No, like so. he, they need the, the body with the muscles to be able to actually do it because it just can't maybe exert enough pressure to do that. Yeah. I can see that. Just maybe, I yeah. buy it just enough. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> All right, let's let's move on. Uh, Halloran is almost a sidewinder. He gets a threatening message from the Overlook telling him not to come any closer. He goes off the road and is rescued by a man driving a snowplow. The man tells him where he can rent a snowmobile and sidewinder. Also, the man seems to indicate that he has a bit of the shine as well. At the Overlook, it's close to five in the evening. Wendy is overcome with curiosity and knife in hand leaves Danny in the quarters to find out if Jack is out of the cellar. He is. He hits her in the stomach with the mallet. She runs to the stairs. He hits her again with the mallet, this time in the ribs. Wendy jumps on his back and plunges the kitchen knife into his lower back up to the handle. She tries to make it up the stairs. He's halfway up now, and Jack is right behind her. We talked about that scene a little bit when we were talking about the mallet. Um, yeah. But yeah, you wanted to touch on the Halloran part. Uh, just the 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 idea that there was another another guy that came along who had the shine was was very convenient but i loved it like i i yeah. love that we got another shining character um and that he potentially wasn't even as strong as halloran so he's not quite as strong as danny he's not quite as strong as halloran but he's got his own thing and he he could tell right away like they just had this like mutual respect and they knew well at first halloran was kind of yelling at him and stuff but i loved that <laughs> that he like he's here's my gloves here's my jacket off my back and just this connection that, that these characters with the shine share um and i also wanted to say i love how it manifests in each character um we don't necessarily yeah. get how it manifests in that character but the smell of oranges being different than danny's uh and, and just yeah. like that that's such a cool way to um differentiate i feel like yeah i like that and and you know when he's on the airplane uh you know he's sitting by that kind of quirky lady mm -hmm. and afterward he mentions that she has a little shine and right. he's he does worry like so to about meeting so many people with the shine as he's traveling um, and so I, I think that's like kind of like an interesting, you know, you kind of get the sense that the forces of light are being arrayed against the forces of evil. And it's kind of a cool thing. Mm -hmm. We um, we talked a little bit about this, I think, in our last episode, James. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but we were talking about narrative time or maybe it was the first Shining episode. And we were talking about how in, in the books you can play with this stuff a little more. And this is a, a cool example to me because this scene of Wendy kind of being chased by Jack is stretched out over multiple chapters. And we're getting the stuff from Dick that spans like hours, right, over the court. Yeah. Whereas she's on this, it makes it feel like she's on the stairs for hours, but she's actually not. Yeah. Um, so it's a cool kind of device you can play with where you can have time progressing differently. And he, he gives us these little touchstones where he says, like, and around this time, Wendy was doing this at the hotel to let us yeah. know that this isn't happening at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. um, it's cool. And I like that you can play with that in writing in a way that can be difficult, at least in film. Yeah, it's super neat. It reminds me kind of... Um... Reminds me a lot of A Song of Ice and Fire and the way that George R. R. Martin is able to thread in and say, like, kind of while this was happening, this was also happening and this and this and this. I feel like that must be so difficult to do <laughs> just like yeah. like logistically to keep it all straight for sure. Well, a lot less characters in this one, at least. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Jack is still right behind Wendy. She almost makes it to her room, but a, qu a, a quote, a man with a green ghoul mask comes out of one of the rooms and scares her. She falls, and then Jack hits her squarely between the shoulder blades. She almost passes out, but manages to crawl and claw her way into the quarters and lock the door. Danny isn't in the room. Jack is trying to get in. Wendy rushes to the bathroom and locks herself inside. 
Jack is in the quarters now, smashing things up. Wendy finds some razor blades in the bathroom. When Jack breaks through them with the mallet, she slashes him. Around this time, uh, he hears the sound of a motor, which he thinks might be might be Halloran in, in a snowmobile. He goes out to find to, to see if that's what what uh, see if that's the case. Wendy comes out of the bathroom and collapses on a mattress. Okay, so a lot covered there, but this is a very this is like an iconic scene in the movie, right? Yeah. And so I want to definitely wanted to get your take on like how does how does this book version compare to you? Well, I think it's it's a they're both wonderful. Um, I feel like the one moment in the movie that's like so great is when she goes to open the window to get out and it's full of snow. Like mm. in the movie, that is just like so powerful. You know, it's, 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 they're trapped, not just because they're in a horrible hotel, but like yeah, that feeling of of the weather and that feeling of of like nature is against you at that very moment is like so powerful. Um, but I feel like in the book, like you're really in Wendy's head and you're feeling like, I mean, she takes so much damage in this these scenes it's like mind-boggling that she does anything and i am like she's you just can't help but like be like yeah wow you just keep going you keep going and <laughs> you know you're like trying to cut him with this razor and it's cutting your thumb off and this is like whoa i thought it was um i think it's really intense and i every time i use her this like you know i'll be reading I, I, the first time i read this i just like I stopped at one point and it just was like so wrenching. Like I know they've had all these problems between them, but this is, you know, this is her husband. This is the person she absolutely loves. And to like be dealing with this is unimaginable. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and I think that's something that is different for me reading it than, than watching it was, I did get a sense of that, how she, she is very aware that this, it is Jack, but isn't Jack, and and yeah. that that she still has feelings for him, and she still feels like sorry for him, and wants him to survive this. And yeah, I mean, you can't get those inner thoughts, I guess, in the movie, but that's not the way I feel like it, it plays out in the film, right? No. And plus, you know, you got Jack just going. I don't know something about you know Nicholson's performance of it just takes it to a whole nother level uh, that you just can't quite capture on the page as, when you get that physicality of, of of an actor performing it. Yeah. I feel like Jack, um, he's so much more of a monster in the film, and and he is here as well, obviously. But but um, the thing that I want to highlight is is like Wendy's, like you were saying, she is fighting against her husband and this person that they've had problems, but she loves him. But she realizes and and is tough enough to to know that like it's it's him or them. And the way that she fights back in this with the razor blades, like you were talking about, and and just like um, protecting Danny and and. I, I don't know. I just feel like it, it's it's a little more than just a scary guy running around at this point in the book. It's it's become all, the embodiment of all of the things that were wrong with their relationship is like all unfolding in now, but it's also the hotel that's doing it yeah. to them. So Yeah. Yeah. It's really intense scene. So good. It's interesting how those lines are so blurred. It seems like we keep coming back to that, like, is it the hotel? Is it Jack? And it seems to me like Kubrick, when he made the film, wanted it to be much more Jack. Yeah. Like, it is yeah. the hotel, too, but he leans heavily towards this guy as a problem. Well, I think it's a lot more grounded, for sure. It's that's And that's yeah. what I think he was going for, was, like, a grounded story of something that could potentially happen. And maybe there's a I mean, little bit of a supernatural element. Yeah, the, the general vibe of the movie is more of a psychological horror story than, than a supernatural horror story. Yeah. Where this is very like there's ghouls jumping out of doors and, and you know, people have like rotting flesh and, and all this stuff. Yeah. Very yeah. supernatural, strong. Uh, we got, you know, the topiary creatures jumping around and, you know, being animated. Speaking of topiary creatures. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of, <laughs> let's get to this next part of uh, su a summary here. Halloran battles the hedge lions with gas and a lighter. He manages to get on the snowmobile and drive it to the porch. He runs into the hotel and calls for Danny. Jack has been waiting in the elevator. When Halloran goes up the stairs, Jack hits him hard in the head and face with the mallet. Now Jack's going upstairs to give Danny his medicine. 
Danny is meeting Tony face to face for the first time, and it's revealed that Tony is Danny ten years in the future, or at least looks like he is. So that's 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 a good bit of stuff to talk about here. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, we've already touched on Halloran, kind of the surprise of him getting bested by Jack it is pretty shocking. Um, but the the really interesting part there to me is the whole Tony stuff, because yeah. uh, I am so fascinated by the idea of Tony, and I assume this is a big thing in Doctor Sleep, which I haven't read yet or seen or anything, so I guess we won't, you know, we won't touch on it because I don't know, and if, if Wendy, you know, don't share with us. Um, <laughs> but we can theorize. Um, the idea of Tony being him is 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 interesting, though, right? Yeah. Did you want to speculate at least, and and maybe maybe? Yeah, let's speculate a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so my spe- I, I speculate that, like you said, it will be covered in in a Doctor Sleep. I think there's some sort of time travel element going on, and he is gonna have to like in that time come back and be like help it, help his former self. And maybe there's a lot of that that goes on in Doctor Sleep. Like maybe it's him going back to help himself throughout or helping others. I, who, Ooh, I, I have didn't no idea. Even think about that possibility. That that I like that though. That's interesting. I, so I have no, I have no idea, no way of knowing if that's true. But um, he, he's also described as as being part Jack, which I obviously, as Danny grows up, he might look a lot like Jack. Yeah, but that's what I, how I took it. That that'll be something interesting to address as well because he loses. Spoiler, I mean, it doesn't matter. Spoilers, <laughs> we're covering all of this. Um, <laughs> yeah, he loses his dad, and then we get that we get a scene where he talks about how he's dealing with it, and Halloran says how he's going to have to deal with it. And uh, like the ways that he can that he can try to um, and to to grow up and look so much like the person who almost killed you. And there's going to be a lot of things to deal with in Dr. Sleep, I think. I'm excited for it. <laughs> so you have read Dr. Sleep, Wendy? I've read it, but I didn't even realize there was a movie of it. Uh, they're make they're making one. I, I, I misspoke because, of course, I haven't seen it. It's not out yet, but they are making one. So we're, we are going to cover it when it comes out, I think. That'll so. be cool. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I think, you know, the, it is... You do have that clue when Danny is at the doctor's office and the doctor says, well, you know why he's called Tony, right? So, you know, there's something. Um, but Wait, why does he, what was the answer to that? Why it's called Tony? It's I don't cause, remember. Because Tony, his name is Daniel Anthony Torrance. Oh. And um, so I didn't even, that, that went right by me. I didn't think about it. Yeah, no, I had no idea. <laughs> you know they they mention it at so at, I think it's only mentioned like maybe once or twice they say something where they use his whole name and you're like oh cool but I think it's I think that whole like there's a lot of Jack in him is really interesting because I mean at the beginning when you first start learning about Jack's dad he sounds like the most horrible person on the planet yeah. and he sounds awful. And you can't imagine like being the son of somebody like that. Like, to, like if you saw your dad beat your mom until she had to be hospitalized, like you would like, you wouldn't necessarily think that um, you would want to honor that person by giving your child any part of them. And they gave, the Torrances gave Daniel his grandpa's name as a middle name. Hmm. And so then at the end, it's kind of come full circle because, I mean, Daniel then watches his, well, he doesn't see it, but, you know, it's described as like he can feel all the things his parents are doing. You know, he basically watches his dad beat his mom until she has to be hospitalized. And it's just like... It's those cycles of violence that are, it seems to be, to me, it seems like a, a big theme in, in King's work is we see that people, the abuse that people, you know, go through and then how it affects their lives going forward and how it can be a, like a perpetuating thing. Yeah. Um, and how that can like imbue places and things with with evil, basically. Yeah. All right, so let's do a little more summary here. Danny hears Jack coming up the elevator and runs. He's trapped in a corridor when Jack comes upon him. He tells the Jack thing that it's not his father. Danny knows the Overlook has completely taken Jack over. A little piece of the former Jack is still there. He tells Danny to run away from him and that he loves him. Danny refuses to run and kisses Jack's hand. Wendy has discovered Halloran and is trying to wake him. Danny realizes Jack hasn't been releasing the pressure on the boiler and tells him so. The Jack thing panics and leaves to go take care of it. Danny knows he has to find Wendy and Halloran so they can get out of the overlook before the boiler explodes. It does, moments after Jack gets down into the cellar. Okay, so that's like a lot of big stuff there happening at the end. 
Um, I do de- definitely want to touch on the moment that Jack sort of comes out and it has his like dad moment. And that's really the last thing we see Jack Torrance do where he's not being completely controlled by the, the hotel, right? Yeah. I feel like if you didn't have that moment where he comes out and is a dad, like I feel like the book would have like a really unsatisfying ending. And I feel like Stephen King is a master at manipulating emotions. Um, and he knows just what you want. Um, and you want to feel bad. You want to feel really bad sometimes like cause at these tragic moments. And so like if he just like stayed a monster through the whole time, it's like, oh, yeah, the good guy has won, whatever. But like you get that last like, oh, there was a tiny bit of good in him and he really did love Danny and look, they reconnected and oh, sugar and goodness and light can't exist in the world. Briefly. Yeah. Very he gives briefly. a little bit of hope, right? Yeah, but it's yeah. almost meaner, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's it's different for sure. Because I, I noticed that, I mean, that's true in It. That's true in, in a lot of his stuff where it, it isn't just bleak. It's like in the end, good can still triumph. Right. In yeah. some way or at least and have have some sort of like Pyrrhic victory or something. Like you said, it's made so much worse by the fact that like right after this, the, the he, like rips his own face off because of the hotel oh. like takes over his body and he like rips his own face yeah. off and like nothing's there. Yeah. And, it, and it, he, the... he mashes it with the with the hammer. Right. Doesn't he keep beating? Oh, himself that's what it is. Yeah, you're it? right. Yeah. Bashes it. And um, it's described as as like taking everything like basically nothing of Jack is left once that face is destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad Danny got to say goodbye, but. <laughs> yeah, so, and then they're able to get Halloran, who is alive, not dead, and uh, they get out, and then the boiler explodes, and it's epic. Like, the whole thing. It's so great. The whole hotel goes up in flames. He, he he describes it in a cool way. Yeah. You know, I, I love the fact that, you know, this whole book, he's been building up and building up and building up these uh, wasp references, you mm. know, and developing, like, the meaning of the wasps and what they are. And, you know, they kind of seem to stand in for a lot of different things. You know, they can just be kind of a general nature of evil. They're just, they are just can be, like, a symbol of threat and danger. Um, they kind of become associated with his dad because he talks about how his dad burnt, you know, smoked out the wasp's nest and then set it on fire and then at the end it just he just unloads the wasps like first you know the papers in the basement catch fire and it's just like burning autumn leaves below a wasp's nest he says and you're Mm. like oh and then (laughs) it finally it hits and the window on that you know presidential suite blows up and out comes the wasp monster and it's just like, oh, at first I felt like uh, the wasps are a little heavy handed. <laughs> but by the end, you know, it was like a real delight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we also see a giant, what's described as almost looking like a manta, I think he, I think he said, shaped like darkness lift out of the hotel and then disappear. And, so and like, did that make you think of uh, another marine animal uh, from it potentially? So, oh, so the turtle? Yeah, so there's a, tur- oh, the there's a giant mystical turtle, and then maybe there's an evil manta. Evil manta and a so giant spider. Yeah. said um, that the, the manta shape was, like, made out of wasps. Yeah. Ooh. I thought it was yeah. a shadow, but maybe. There were definitely wasps were, like, filling the air, too, and, and yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, it might be. Uh, yeah, let's see. From the window of the presidential suite, he thought he saw a huge, dark shape issue, blotting out the snowfield behind it. For a moment, it assumed the shape of a huge, obscene manta, and then the wind seemed to catch it, to tear it, and shred it like old dark paper. It fragmented, was caught in a whirling eddy of smoke, and a moment later it was gone as if it had never been. Uh, but in those few seconds, it whirled blackly, dancing like negative motes of light. He remembered something from his child 50 years ago or more. They had, he and his brother had come upon a huge nest of ground wasps. And then he says, and then the thing in the sky was gone. So yeah. it, it is a manta, and it is reminiscent of mom. Yeah, wasps. it made him think of the wasps. I mean, yeah. it, may, it may be, I mean, and I'm, uh, clearly they're all connected, right? Yeah, it it's is. All... Yes, it's both. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's cool. And yeah, like I, I love that. It's sort of to me, like I said, it's kind of that Lovecraftian, like unknowable. Yeah. What was that? Like, and, and it's never hell? really explained. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's some great writing that. there too. That was like uh, a, I really like that when 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 he turns on that language, he really he can really lay it on. Yeah, I mean, he has great control of his prose, mm. and uh, he can write. He can turn a good sentence, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, he, most of the time, if he's talking about people peeing themselves and goo coming out of their body parts, but then <laughs> he can lay on the beautiful writing when he wants to. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, and then the last scene here before we get the epilogue is is them going to the equipment shed to get blankets for the long ride ahead, and then the Overlook almost makes ah! Halloran murder Danny, uh, but he's able to resist, and then they all escape. And and he says, you know, I'm never going to come within another hundred miles of this place. <laughs> I feel like that's like such a great part, right? Like that's like the movie ends, you know, is so like. I don't know, you know, it's like, okay, Jack's gone, everything hunky and or dory. Mm. But this ends on that note that uh, anybody could get poisoned by the overlook. Anybody, even somebody as good and wonderful and kind as Dick Halloran could get used by it when it's in a full spate, you know. And I did feel like retroactively that made me feel more sorry for Jack, yeah. Because cause it makes it seem like it's very powerful, the fact that it almost gets Halloran, of all people, to do this, right? Right. Um, but I don't. I guess I don't know if I actually prefer that, um, because I kind of don't want to let Jack off the hook. Like, I, 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 like <laughs> to, I like the idea of him being a little bit more at fault, just personally, yeah. um, because he nice. does seem pretty reprehensible, especially early on in the novel. Um, so I kind of don't like the idea of just kind of totally forgiving him at the end and just saying, oh, he's a victim of the hotel and that's all it was. Right. No, I, I agree with you that yeah. he is a repre- reprehensible, disgusting human being and kind of gets what he deserves. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Yeah, kind of. Have, Although he like maybe he could have changed, you know, I like that there's a tragedy there, too, of, of it seems like he genuinely wanted to at a certain yeah. point. And then and he was hoping yeah. to make a better life for them. I don't know. He's a very fascinating character, I think, because of that. And I can also see why why Kubrick decided he wanted to go a different way. Um, also, famously, uh, the the novel ends in fire and the movie ends in ice. Yeah. And that's something that King has said that he always didn't like. Like, it didn't sit well with him. He felt like it ended the wrong way. So I just wanted to get your take on that, uh, James. Um, have you ever heard of that, like, th- that discrepancy? And, and what did you think of the differences there? I, I hadn't heard that before, but that that is cool. I, I, and... I don't know that I feel like it ended wrongly. I kind of understand what, I don't know. There's a little more spectacle to an explosion and like it's kind of more finite. Whereas I feel like Kubrick's like frozen ending, ice ending is more of like a, it's more of like a subtle ending. I don't know. I think it's cool that he well, did and like, like a an fire explosion and, and a fire that all kind of lines up with temper and anger, right? Right. So I, I think metaphorically, I can see maybe like King really likes that metaphor I of an that, explosion yeah. coming yeah. to a head. The pressure, the building pressure. But it's all like, that. what about like the ice quelling the fire, like stopping yeah. that anger and like like snuffing it out? Like I, like I, yeah. I understand. I think what where King is coming from, but I also don't know which one I prefer actually right now. I'll have to get back to you about that. I kind of feel like the movie has a more scary ending, mm. right? Like because mm-hmm. you've got a haunted hotel, and at the end of the movie, like the hotel is still haunted, yeah. and Jack is like permanently welded to its yard <laughs> um and uh the it's evil like, of the hotel lives on right yeah exactly yeah. it's a much more like it is there's no feeling of like good one in the end um it's just it was more survival yeah just survival mm. and that last image i don't know like seeing him frozen like that it just makes me think of like the Donner party and it's just it's like like human f- like like there's this real sense to that ending like there is this human folly to have ever like decided to build a hotel any place where the elements are that terrible and mm. like needs like that you know the hotel on its own can't survive the winter so like it's just like a ridiculous concept in the first place. 
I definitely want to revisit this when we get to the movie, and I was going to save it for the movie episode, but because we're talking about it, I think it's worth mentioning. Um, I've heard that after filming was over, the sets they used for the hotel actually burned down. <gasps> what? Whoa! Yeah. Weird. Uh, yeah, after filming was over. So those sets all got destroyed in, in like a freak accident fire. Hmm. That is really cool. So Stephen King broke into the studio and was like... <laughs> It's going down my way. <laughs> I will have my revenge. <laughs> yeah, so ooh, why did that happen? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We should we should definitely look in because there's so many fun little stories about the movie that I'm sure we can, yeah. we can try and get into. Ooh, oh, I can't wait to yeah. listen to the podcast when you guys do that episode. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so we got one final section here. It's the nice kind of rosy epilogue. The novel yeah. ends the following summer. Wendy, Danny, and Halloran are in the main res- are in a main resort where Halloran works. Wendy and Danny are moving to Maryland. The novel ends with Wendy and Halloran sitting on either side of Danny while he catches fifth fish beneath the afternoon sun. Um, yeah, so this is a very just like rosy happy ending. Um, which yeah, like uh, we talked about, I think I think King likes happy endings actually. He, uh, from what I've read from him, he tends to come around to a happy ending. I'm I'm sure that's not always the case. He's written enough to where I'm sure that there that is not always true. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. He's got like a positive end here. It makes you it's feel good. It's nice, and I feel like one of the things like that makes this ending feel so good. I mean, we don't totally know what's going on. Well, I guess we do know, like. We do know, actually, because she mentions this life insurance policy. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the real engine of the story is their financial situation, right? It's it's one of the, I think it's like the most powerfully terrifying thing in the book. Um, you know, she can't go stay with her mom. She doesn't have any skills. He doesn't have any real skills. He's an English teacher. Yeah. And just like to be so powerfully trapped by your economic situation and then yeah this is like such a great happy ending like oh there's enough money for danny to go to college and it's gonna be hunky and great and swell and we can even stay at this motel i mean this resort and maybe that part of that's because halloran's pulling strings but just that they have like resources now that they didn't have is so great so now that we've gotten to the end and, and, and Danny has survived, the last time we didn't want to spoil it by talking about it, but Dr. Sleep, from what I understand, is about Danny as an adult. Yeah. And uh, I am going to be interested now to track this economic arc because, like you said, the economics trapped him and their family. And then at the end, it's, we're given this rosy picture of, like, now you have this money and it's sort of solved everything. Um, I am going to be curious, too, because I think it's interesting to consider King's arc where he was very uh, poor, at least lower middle class growing up, and and then he hit it so big and is now famously ultra rich from his writing. Yeah. And I wonder if he feels that that money sort of like paved the way and everything's hunky dory now, or or what? Like I'm I'm really, I'd be really curious to know how he feels about wealth and now that he has attained it, does it did it live up to maybe what he thought it was going to be like when he was younger, chasing after it still. Yeah, I wonder um, I, about that, too. Yeah, and I wonder if that's in the writing at all. I'll be curious to see. I'll, I'm going to look for that, at least. Yeah, I I feel like money isn't a concern for a lot of his characters in, like, his newer works, like Lisey's Song and Duma Key. Um, so I feel like maybe that old fear of being poor sort of maybe left him. But I do think that he has, like, a really strong sense of knowing his roots and stuff. Like, mm. I know, like, a couple years ago, there's, like, a special fund that helps people pay, like, their heating bill when, like, they are they can't afford it. And, like, the state of Maine was having budget shortfalls, so, like, they couldn't, like, they had to, like, stop the program in the middle of winter because they just didn't have the money to, like, do anything. And so Stephen King came in and he, he funded it. So, you know, because it's so cold mm. in Maine in the winter. Yeah. And so all these poor people got to have their heating bills paid and could actually, you know, have heat in their house. And it's like, I do think that even though he is really rich and he does, he gets to spend the winter in Florida now. um, I think that he does remember at least what it's like to grow up without a lot of money and stuff. Yeah. You always want to see that. That's, that's so cool. Makes me happy. All right, so I think let's maybe some. Do you have any other general thoughts about the about the novel now that we finished reading it, James? Is your first time through? Overall thoughts about your experience? I, like I said, basically at the beginning, I'm really glad that I have this source material now because 
it, even though there are so many of the so many of the those differences through through the novel and the and the film, um, I they're still clearly connected in in every way because they're they're a, the same story with a few changes. So I feel like it's it's cool to. I'm going to project a lot of what we read in the book on the characters this time when we watch the film and kind of see where it differs and where it, you know, where it's the same, because maybe, maybe Kubrick was putting subtext in there that I hadn't realized before with this knowledge that I have now from the novel, I'll be able to add because there's so much that you can't do just due to time constraints. So it'll be cool to see like Mm -hmm. specifically a character I want to pay attention to is Wendy because we talked about it a lot. Um, from what I remember of it, she she um, doesn't have quite as much um, agency. Agency, exactly. Mm. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, I did. Oh, you know what? This this reminds me. Um, last episode, I think James and I were both a little negative on uh, the hedge animals. Both of us thought they just weren't really that scary. Um, yeah. I wanted to check back in with w- w- the, the the latest scenes we got with them, and then also just see Wendy in general. Do you find the hedge animals scary, or 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 do you find them a little silly, or, or where do you fall on that? I mean, I am definitely like if you had to choose between the maze that's in the movie and the hedge animals, like there's no comparison. The maze is like a million times more terrifying, right? Like it's so claustrophobic and scary. And so the hedge animals, yeah. Um, I think, you know, kind of the goal of the hedge animals is to have something that's innocent and cute and sweet, then be really subverted. Um, and I feel like that works super well with the playground equipment, right? Like Mm. the playground equipment, like the concrete, like tubes to crawl through and things like that. Like, that is like really scary and I think they do a great job like being, you know, innocent subverted. Um, but yeah, it's hard to get too terrified about giant plants, right? <laughs> I mean, even even in Little Shop of Horrors, you're not really that scared of Audrey. Let's just face it. Um, but I do really um I do like the image of them uh, at there is like this moment like Danny has a vision of them like the the building being on fire and like the hedge animals being all burnt and his mom's saying look Danny at the hedge animals and you know he's like looking at their burnt thing and then like at the end you know, you do see the hedge animals and it's Dick that's saying, look at them. And they're all, and no, actually Dick doesn't say anything. Danny just says, they're dead. They're dead. They're all dead. And he's like so happy that they're dead. Yeah. And it's the kind of the contrast between how his vision was and how the animals really are. And just the idea of these like things that were cute that then became terrifying. Um, and then just being like these brittle, burnt up, hollow things is kind of, I think maybe kind of a little bit what this, what the whole story is about. It's like, you know, the hotel seems like this charming, adorable place to stay in the Colorado Rockies. And isn't it great? And look how swell it is. And then it becomes really menacing. And then at the end, you realize that it's... It was never really that special or great to begin with. It's just sticks. It's just powered by it's just sucking off life from other people. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah. I think if you want to if you want to see some scary plants, I think Jeff Vandermeer will right. probably be able to yeah. get you that. <laughs> I, when, when plants start interfacing with our bodies and in, in weird and disgusting ways, then they get really creepy to me. Yes, but yeah, absolutely. a big a big lion swiping at me with its branch arms isn't as scary. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. The uh, even these scenes, I was still I was still I, I kind of got a better sense of what they could do to someone had mm-hmm. they gotten a hold of somebody like they do to Halloran. Right. But I right. still it's still just burn them with fire, and you're you you'll be all right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think my other thought I have kind of like on the large scale of this is, um, you know, it, just the writing of this book, I think I think King was trying to challenge himself and push himself. It's a very operatic novel. Mm. It's got, you know, he's he's really does his best to go between. We, like really get in deep to like the different characters but he's also like trying stylistic things like there are some pages 
where like, you know, uh, he'll like intercut the regular voice that he's using with like things that are set off in italics, either music or thoughts from the hotel or flashes from other times and things. Uh, It could almost be awkward to read in in some places because it does get kind of like, you know, Mm. overblown. It's like having an aria where the chorus is also shouting kind of thing. Um, But you can, I really feel like he was trying to push himself when he wrote this book. He's experimenting with different yeah. different things. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting because I, I, you see a lot, I don't know, I do, and when you're in workshops and stuff, you see a lot of writers trying these things to, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it really doesn't. And, yeah. And, and often they'll look at a great, like, Stephen King and say, well, Stephen King does it, you know, and it, it's, it's um a lot of these things have a high level of difficulty associated with them, and even someone like King doesn't necessarily, like, doesn't mean it isn't occasionally awkward. Right, um, yeah. Yeah. It's it's that stuff's all very interesting because it's like there is no real hard and fast rule about what you can and can't do, and it's more just trying it, and and you'll have varying levels of success or how well you pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> totally true. Totally. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, I think that's we've covered everything now. That's that's the shining the novel. Uh, thank you so much, Wendy, for coming on to help us finish it out right. Oh, it was so fun. <laughs> Yeah, we really enjoyed having you. Um, it's been a pleasure to, to, to talk about this novel with you. I do want to say if our, our our listeners would like to check out your book, uh, An Oath of Dogs, um, it's it's out now. You can pick it up. I think uh, you know Amazon or local bookstores. It's it's, it's it seems to be everywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Check it out. Do you want to tell me maybe a little bit about that novel? Oh, sure. Uh, it's like a science fiction thriller. It's a uh, set. In the not too distant future, it's like maybe 300 years ahead, and we've started to develop our first habitations on another planet, um, which if you live here in Oregon like Luke and I do, mm. uh, you will see some some definite connections to the Pacific Northwest with these enormous trees and things like that. Anyway, so it's about a lady who moves to this planet with her therapy dog, and when she gets there, she discovers that the guy who hired her just vanished into the woods and is apparently dead and nobody seems to have a problem with that and uh except her and the more she learns about what's going on in their small town the more she's convinced that maybe the giant mega corporation that they work for might have something to do with his death cool and i love dogs and so i've been sold on this novel for a while i haven't gotten a chance to read it but it's high on the list i need to pick it up Yay. um this this even just solidifies it even more are there topiary creatures in there <laughs> in the forest <laughs> no but there are a ton of different kinds of plants and trees and creatures that are weird and disturbing so cool that sounds good to me i uh one of my friends told me he there was one scene afterwards he he felt like he couldn't go to sleep and i felt like that was the <laughs> best compliment i ever got right you know, like, stephen king fans should appreciate that for sure that is correct definitely. <laughs> i'll definitely be checking that out that sounds awesome oh thank you so wendy would you like to let our listeners know where they can find you online sure uh, my website is a really dumb name it's a uh, winnie woohoo.com uh <laughs> That's fine. Uh, and uh, I'm on Twitter as WN Wagner. And I have a author page on Facebook, too. It's Wendy N. Wagner. You should absolutely follow her on Twitter. Wendy's amazing, and you should read her all of her books. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming on, Wendy. Yes, thank uh, you so much. Thank you guys so much. All right, and we just want to thank Wendy again for coming on. That was so much fun talking about The Shining with her, and we hope that she can come back in uh, on again in the future. Yeah, that would be awesome. This week, we wanted to thank one of our patrons, Barbara M. Uh, thank you again for being a patron and supporting this podcast. And if you wanted to help support as well, you could go to patreon.com forward slash ink to film. And we have uh, four or five, four different tiers. And um, each of those will give you different benefits, and, and we would really appreciate your support. Absolutely. And if you would like to get in on the conversation uh, going on right now, um, we have a Facebook group called the Council of Inklings, and we'd love for you to come join it. Um, also, we have a page on Facebook, at ink to film and then we also have an Instagram and a Twitter, at ink to film on both. Come follow us, hook up on there, and we can, we can chat about book and film adaptations. If you wanted a way to help the podcast out without spending any money, we would really appreciate a, a rating or a re- review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. 
um, it really helps to get our, our name out there and potentially get more listeners in the future. Yeah, and we just wanted to thank uh, Ross Bugden for the use of our intro and outro music. Oh, I also wanted to say before we go, uh, I'm going to be at Viable Paradise next week. So we're actually going to try and put out uh, the live recording of my American Psycho presentation I did at OMSI. And that'll be our next episode you'll see in our feed. Um, And then the week following that is when we'll actually get to the Shining film. So make sure to look for that. Yeah, it'll be it'll be right around the time of Halloween. So it'll be perfect timing. Yeah, I I can't wait to watch it. I'm very excited. I've seen the movie a bunch, but I haven't seen it in a long time. So I'm excited to revisit it, especially with the book so fresh in my mind. I cannot wait. Oh, and it's on Netflix. So you can if you have Netflix, you can watch it like easily. Okay. until next time. Thanks for listening.